And we are live. Hey guys, this is Ruben from Dub's Podcast Connection Loop. Today I got Alex Miner on with me, and we were just kind of uh, jib jabbing a little bit about how our kids kind of bomb our our Zoom calls and our podcast all the time, <laughs> and and how it's just become part of our lives. I mean, my kid actually not only did he remove the lock on on the studio here, but he also removed the door handle, um, so he's got full access. So sometimes they make a visit, but Alex, nevertheless, you know, you, you've got some great stories to tell on LinkedIn. I've seen your stuff, you know, video marketing, storytelling. Um, talk to us, man. Why, why are our marketing videos failing us? What are we doing wrong and how can we improve them? Uh, the, the biggest reason that marketing videos aren't working a lot of the time or most of the time, I think, is that people just aren't putting themselves in the customer's shoes. Uh, I, I was even just watching a marketing video late last night uh, from a roofing company. They had put it on there. It, it was something they put on their YouTube. And as soon as, you know, the ball got rolling in this guy, I think he was the owner was getting into, it. he's talking about how long the company has been around and the features that, or, you know, the machinery that they have available in their workshop. It's like, and I'm sitting there like, but I don't care about how long you've been around and how much machinery you got in your workshop. I want to know that if I need you to put on a roof, you're going to get there fast. You're going to do, you're going to do a good assessment that you could work with my insurance company. If the reason that you're out here is that, that, uh, you know, I got a tree through my roof and that it's going to get done quickly and it's going to be a quality job. Like none of this stuff matters to me. And, and, you know, it was four minutes of this guy going on about this stuff. And I'm just like, and I'm like, no, nobody's going to sit through this, dude. Like, you're not addressing my concerns. Uh, and, and that's why I feel like, that's why I feel like a lot of companies are, are missing the mark because it's like, you really have to have a consumer first approach. You got to put yourself in their seat, looking at the video and be like, what question do they need answered? What worry do they have? What problem are they looking to get solved? Um, because that's why all of us are in business. We're looking for a problem that we can solve or, or, you know, to provide a service or a product that people want, but they don't have the time or inclination to make themselves, or they don't have the expertise to do it themselves. You know, that's, that's why this whole thing works. So that's awesome. It's not easy to do. You know, there's so much jargon about that, like uh, ICP, ideal customer profile and the personas and the ideal clients. And there's so many different ways to do that. But I think what we all suffer from is massive cases of myopia for our business. Like we're in it and we know our stuff. We know our gear. We know our tech. We know our lingo. And it's hard for us to jump out of that and be like, yeah. imagine what it's. I was just doing this exercise this morning and I realized how uncomfortable it was for me. I was like, I, it's hard for me to pretend or put myself into the you know, the, the mindset of the customer that doesn't know what I know, they know something completely different and to feel that compassion or feel that empathy or want to provide information. How do we do that? How do we break out of our mold to start to think like that? It it's hard. And, and you know, like I'm trying to build a business in this marketing space and you're right. Like all those terminologies, ideal customer, cust client avatar, all those things. It it's, like some of it, I feel is like a little bit cliche. Like, yes, it has a point and a purpose, but it, it's it's so clinical. It really makes it hard to get down to the the meat and potatoes of it, the organic parts of it. And I, th the way that I try to approach it is really asking questions. You know, when I when I'm sitting with a client. And, or a potential client and trying to figure out if they even need me. It's all about asking questions. Cause it's like, I don't, I don't know you. I don't know your business. I don't know how you work, but I need to find out if I'm going to help tell your story. And, and so it's really just about making things more personal. Um, and, and I feel like marketing these days has, Oh, or with the advent of social media and social media marketing being such a big thing of business these days is it's, that's what's 
that's what people are craving. They're craving that personal connection. That's why personal branding has become like the biggest buzzword now. And everybody is all about, oh, you need a personal brand and, and you know, the power, like all those cliches that you're hearing flying on LinkedIn and YouTube and, and all these other places. Um, but there's the, it's a reality though, because 20 years ago, a teenager couldn't go on Twitter and communicate directly with their favorite pop star, you know, their favorite rapper. Um, you know, you couldn't message your favorite artist because they weren't on an Instagram and you couldn't see new creations from them as soon as they're released. People are craving that connection and that feeling that they have an opportunity to actually get to know and be face to face digitally with all these different types of people, even with, uh, you know, politicians, big corporations, it's, it's become kind of an expectation. Uh, we were talking about Twitter a little bit earlier. So it, these days it's like, if you're a big business and you have a Twitter account and somebody messages you and you don't get back to them within like 24 hours, most people consider that a failure. Yeah. But, but, you couldn't right. do that 20 years ago. Like that was right. not an expectation 20 years ago. That wasn't a thing that it, it was like, never would it enter in the realm of possibility. Maybe you thought you could call an 800 number on the back of the box and be on the phone for two hours, waiting <laughs> for somebody to finally pick up. And then right. you're, you know, somebody going through the script and you really figure you're not going to get anywhere. But now people expect real answers and to be treated like human beings instead of just a number. Yeah, man. This this is the dream right here. You're talking about the dream. It is really tough, man. So how do you how do you advise people, man? How do you what's like a tactical approach to this? Because you know, there's all sorts of books out there and there's all sorts of charts and visuals to, to think about, you know, this this like buyer psychology. But what what's like the most if we're if we're just in a room and we're brainstorming if we're in a Zoom call and we're just brainstorming right now how do we communicate better with our with our customers how do we create relationships you know write love letters to our customers how do we wh what can we do how do we just break out of our 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 mold? Um, it, it's back to that whole asking questions thing. Like I I have to help my clients figure out um, what matters. You know, because a lot of times what we as the business person thinks matters is not what really matters to the end user. So I'm asking people questions like, OK, what kind of customers are, are coming through your door? Who who is who is using your service? Um, you know, not your idea, like who in reality is using your service, like who like the type of the average person who walks in, who are they? And, and what is the product or service that you're selling the most of? Um, because that right away tells you a lot about the direction of the business currently or, or what matters to your customer base. And it's like, what are they buying from you the most? You know, that, that right there tells you maybe what you should be doing more of or what kind of services you should be developing to go in conjunction with that. Um, and, and then, you know, asking questions like, well, okay, if somebody is a customer, is it a one-time transaction or is it, are they coming back for the same thing or does that lead to other services and what are those products and services that they're coming back for? Uh, it, and once you start to like map that out, it becomes a little bit easier to kind of put yourself in their shoes and really define what their journey with you or your company is like and what their major concerns are. But then there's another thing that you can do that a lot of people forget. You can ask. Like if you got an email list, if you got a customer base, or even if you don't have an email list, if you just got clients that you've worked with, call them up, ask, you know, you can ask like, Hey, why did Wait, you let me, let, me, to let me get this straight? So you want us to actually talk to our customers? Yes. Yes. <laughs> like you can, there's nothing wrong with calling up a customer and saying, uh, especially if you're a smaller business and being like, why did you choose my business? Like, what was it that made, cause there's always somebody else who does what you do or, or says that they do what you do. Maybe they don't really, but there's plenty of people who say that they do what you do or something similar. There's nothing wrong with asking your client, why did you choose me? 
You know, what was it that made you decide to spend your money with me as opposed to somebody else? Because I'm sure if you hop on Google, you'll find another service, you'll find another product, you'll find another widget, but you chose to spend your money here. What made you do that? Um, and, and you could be surprised. I've heard tons of business coaches say that lots of times you'll be surprised at the answer. Um, and, and I've been surprised at the answer when I've, when I've asked people, uh, or when they've told me sometimes, sometimes people will tell you without you even asking, you know, some, uh, one of my clients told me was a video that they saw, you know, that, well, <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a video, it works. That, right. But it wasn't even a video that was like a marketing video. It wasn't a video that was made with the point of, Hey, my service is great. You should use me. But it, but they liked the quality that they saw. They liked the story that was being told in the video. Um, I was in this particular video and they were like, I saw that. And then I, and after that, I saw a video that was actually about your company. And those two things combined made me say, I want to work with you. <laughs> Got it. So in that, in that case, I mean, that's, that's kind of a perfect one, two punch because they probably discovered something that was maybe non-corporate or non-marketing was more maybe personality based. And then they, entered your little ecosystem your little content world and then at some point they saw another video and then they're like we gotta we gotta talk to this person that is called cloning yourself which is i think one of your big themes in fact yeah you know? the, the one of the things that people don't realize is that uh i'm sure a bunch of us have heard of gary v uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, for those who don't know who he is, he's a he's a big time businessman, and he's, he's a, all he's a about big TikToker, right? Uh, yes, he's <laughs> he is super yeah. excited about TikTok. He's telling everybody who will listen that TikTok is something that if even if you're not going to use it every day, it's something that you need to kind of like test the waters with and figure out because the next thing that comes down the road is going to build off of whatever TikTok does. And I and right. I agree with him on that. Like I personally haven't spent a lot of time on TikTok. I haven't figured out the platform yet. But I got friends who are experimenting and telling me that they're getting, you know, good results, even if the only result that they're looking for is more views, right? Uh, more awareness. Um, but with producing content, which a lot of people are afraid to do, um, you got to realize every time you put a piece of content, and that doesn't have to be video, that can be a blog post, that can be a tweet, that can be a Facebook post, an Instagram post, whatever it is. Every time that you put yourself or put a piece of content out there, you are in effect cloning yourself. You're putting another piece of yourself out onto the digital landscape and leaving it where somebody might stumble across it. So if you produce a hundred videos, that's a hundred more chances that you're giving for the world at large to discover who you are. If, if you, I mean, if you make five videos, that's five more chances that you're giving people to discover who you are. But then if you go even further and instead of just letting those videos exist in one place, you're starting to implement them in multiple places. You start to promote them. You start to you run them in a Facebook ad or a Google campaign or an Instagram campaign. Now you're exponentially cloning yourself and putting yourself in more spots for people to find out who you are. And those are resources. Those are assets that can work for you 24-7, 365. You know, it's the it's the employee that you only have to pay for once that doesn't need to go on a bathroom break, that doesn't ask for vacation time because in, in effect, they're a cyber clone, you know, and, and it's just people need to give themselves more opportunities to be found. That's one reason why I'm doing podcasts like this now, you know, like, I don't know who your audience is, but I'm sure there's a good number of people who are going to hear this and maybe they'll become curious about me and my company and they'll look up. I am media plug. Um, and, and, you know, find out what I we're am all media about. Plug. <laughs> let's so, get, let's get a plug. Let's get a plug. I am media.com. Help me out. Yes. I am media.com. E Y E A M M E D I A. Nice. And, and so, you know, every time that you're, every time you're doing a podcast, you're giving more people a chance to discover you, to discover dub, to find out what you're all about, um, to see like kind of the heart of who you are, the type of person that you are, and and maybe your values align with theirs. Maybe they don't even need your product today, but they like the cut of your jib. And so they're going to keep track of you and the content that you're putting out. And someday they may have that need and then they'll become a customer. Right. You know? um, isn't, like, it, isn't it funny? Yeah, man, I, I love what you're saying, man. I really do. 
isn't it funny how if we there's also a dynamic a change in the in the way in which we form that relationship you know like if we create that parasocial relationship where someone sees a video of us or something about our business and then they get to know us it's so much it's so much of a safer environment you know it's on their device mm -hmm. It's not a phone call. It's not an email in their inbox. It's something that they discovered, and they're making a choice. And by yeah. proxy, I think they're they're open minded. You know, they're open hearted, and they're more susceptible. Not to mention, there's all sorts of social proof. They can see that someone else shared this, or there's some validation, some comments, some likes, whatever it is. And then the next time they see you, you know, they're like, "I know that guy. I've seen Alex. You know, I know that." And then all of a sudden, the next piece is maybe something that's educational and something that can really benefit them. And now all of a sudden it's like a perfect entryway. And I think what's, what I see a lot is people actually disrupt or they actually mess up that flow because they are getting original content out there, but then they get too aggressive and then they start to do more automation and emails and this and this. And you well, know, I'm not I, saying think, I think automation and emails and everything is good. I think you no. should be, I, I mean, if you have the time and the means to set that stuff up, I think it's a powerful, it's powerful tools to, to have in your war chest. And I, I think people should be doing that, but like you were saying, um, too much of that can be a turnoff. Uh, so you got to figure out what the balance is. Yes. How, how many emails you should be sending exactly. out a month. Uh, you know how often people actually want to see your face. But but I I'm also of the mindset because you you depending on the platform that you like using, you hear a lot of gurus or coaches tell you that oh you shouldn't be making more or you shouldn't be posting more than this many times per week on Instagram or you shouldn't be posting more than this many times a day. My thing is if if people vibe with you, if people, and this is why video is so powerful to me, um, because it, it enables you to more quickly get a genuine picture of who somebody is, especially if the video that they're seeing is just part of like a real conversation like we're having now. Um, it's the, the fact I, I personally believe that if somebody really likes your energy, likes the vibe of you likes your content that they they won't get enough you know there won't be too much um as, as long as the stuff that you're putting out is stuff that they resonate with they won't care if you show up in their feed five times a day because it's all going to be stuff that they agree with or that they like or that they that gives them a good feeling now i mean email yeah, you might show up in somebody's inbox too much. But if we're talking about social feeds, the way these algorithms work, nobody's ever going to see everything that you put out unless they're a super fan and are purposely trying to see everything that you put out. So to me, there's there's not really a too much. There may be too much for you personally. You can't you might not be able to handle that sustained amount of output over time. So if there's, you know, a mark that you want to hit like putting out I don't know, five pieces of content a day or three pieces or whatever it is. Um, yeah. You you also need to figure out what works for you because there are people who are killing it, putting out one piece of content a week, you know, um, but other people who feel that they got to put out something every day. Um, some people feel like they got to put out multiple pieces of content every day. And I feel like if you're cultivating the right audience, if you're finding your tribe, as a lot of people like to say, that there's no way that you can do too much because they want to see you in their feed. That's the other thing. It's like people got to people got to choose for you to show up in their feed. Now, depending on the platform and, and how the algorithms work and everything, um, you may appear in somebody's feed who's not following you because they're friends with somebody else. They follow somebody else. And so you may end up recommended and popping up that way. But all they're doing is saying, all right, if you're a friend with this person and this person likes this, there's a chance that you may like it too. Right. But if they don't interact with it when it comes up in their feed, they're probably not going to see you again. Right. Exactly. There's those doggos are smart, man. They're, those are, they're our friends. <laughs> you know, they're mining as much data as they possibly can on us, but they're also not delivering content that we're not interesting, interested in. Why would they, you know, all these social platforms are monetized by advertising. So yep. why would they feed content to an individual from someone else where that person is not interested in not checking out? That means that they don't make enough ad revenue from that. So it's kind of a, I think it's like a self healing. Uh, it's a self healing thing really, you know, yeah, um, and even even with the whole ad thing, um, there's 
most of the platforms you can if you take the time take that extra five seconds you can click on that ad and there's usually something saying that i don't like this ad i don't want to see content yeah. like this so you can curate your feeds right. as a user as it and the thing is people feel like all this stuff is forced on them when social media is really a choice you didn't have to make that account you didn't have to follow that person you you don't have to see the content that you don't want to see you know all of this stuff is a choice um, and, and I think more people need to start taking their power back as the consumers of social media and remembering that they don't have to see the stuff that they don't want to see. So if somebody makes a comment that turns you off, unfollow them. Right. You know, if, right. if you see an ad that you don't want to see, find the little part that you can click on to say, I don't want to see ads like this. Right. Their machine learning, they, they, their whole goal, all these platforms, is to keep you on the platform as long as possible. So if you're not having a good user experience, you're not going to use it. And so you can really curate your feed and make it so that you're only seeing the things that you want to see because they want you to have fun. They want you to want, enjoy being there. If you're not enjoying it, you're not going to use it and they're not going to make as much money. Love that. We all need to do a better job to curate the content that we're seeing on social. And I think we need to do that for two reasons. Number one is just to have a better user experience. When we're on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and we don't want to see something from, from a particular advertiser or on a particular topic, we should let the ad you know, platforms know or let the social exactly. know. I agree with you, man. And I also think that you know, as creators, as posters, we should know that people are doing that, or at least they should do that. Maybe we should even be self-reflexive about it. You know, saying stuff like, listen, if you're not interested in comments like this, you know, please unfollow me because I don't want to waste your time. I see it all the time on YouTube. They're, they're, well, not all the time, but there are creators that I follow on YouTube that'll be like, like, hey, if you don't like it, you know, unfollow me. Like, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's powerful. You know, I also think that there's, okay, there's this sort of objection that, you know, people might have. Like, how can I go and post on social in the quantity that I want to or I need to to kind of make effect the change without necessarily you know spending a lot of money on advertising. How can I do that while still running my business, manage my responsibilities, do all the things that I need to do? Now I think that there's this brilliant opportunity here, which I think you you do on a on a daily basis because you're all about cloning yourself. And that's just taking your conversations to social. If someone asks you a question over email, if someone tweets a question to you, if someone texts you a question and you get some 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 topic you can you can send an email to that person you can call them you can text them you can do something or you can take your answer and you can give it to the masses and you can have their exactly. you can have them in mind you know you don't need to mention their name but you can say hey you know someone actually asked me this question on CRO conversion rate optimization and i wanted to say xyz on that topic and then all of a sudden that's a great linkedin post it's and a great LinkedIn post. It's a great Facebook post. It's a great yeah, YouTube exactly. video, Instagram video, IGTV. Here, here's the thing, and, and this is one of the one of the simplest strategies to making you know high quality content. Which yeah. that's another one of those buzzwords that gets misused. Um, <laughs> Almost strategy, as much as authentic content, right? But the strategy is this: give the people what they want. And it's exactly what you said. If somebody asks you a question, most likely other people have the same question. Right. If multiple people ask you the same question, you should definitely be making a, a piece of content on that. Right. Um, like when I consult with people and they start asking me about, well, I don't know what type of videos to make. I don't have any topics. I'm the first thing I say is like, okay, well, in a week, what's the question that you get asked the most by new customers? Right. right. Or, or via email by people who, who might be interested in in using your services. Well, uh, back, back to my previous joke, if you don't know what content to produce, you're probably not listening to your customers. It's true. Because that's it's the true. content. <laughs> it's true. Like a lot of, like you see my content on LinkedIn, a lot of the content that I make on LinkedIn is things that I've either seen people ask about or right. questions that I had myself. And went and found the answer for. Um, and, and those have been some of my most popular videos or my most well-performing videos is just answering the questions that right. I see people have. 
Um, or, or the one, like I said, the ones that I have myself, because if I'm asking it, somebody else is asking it. Uh, like I've, I got to do a video soon on like hashtags on LinkedIn and stuff, because I had somebody ask me about it the other day. Uh, I've had a few people ask me about it and, and like, I've been actively looking into it, trying to figure out whether they work, how they work, you know, what, what the good practices are. Um, and because most people aren't writing about this stuff, so I got to figure it out myself. Right. Nice. Nice, man. That's, that's so important, man. Just this idea of listening, you know, isn't talking so much more about listening. It is, it is. Um, and that's why uh, a mentor of mine told me, you know, why I ask so many questions now when I'm with a potential client or somebody who is might be interested in, in using my services or just getting into producing video um, as a whole, even if it's not with me. Most of what I do is ask questions and then listen to their answers. Um, and, and I've been told many times that if you aren't asking questions, you aren't controlling the conversation. Right. Right. You know, there's this idea of, you know, peeling the onion back on on why we do the things that we do or why we do not do the things that we do. And, you know, a lot of people, I'm just thinking about that question. Like, I don't know what to, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know what my content should be like. Right. And, you know, there's this idea of, well, maybe you do know what it should be about. You're just not necessarily comfortable talking about that in a social setting. Yeah, you can do it it on on a phone call, but a lot of it, I think, is actually self-confidence. And I know this personally because I've I've gone through this. I mean, I still go this to a certain extent. And, you know, it's this idea of feeling comfortable enough to put your stuff out on the Internet that can live Mm -hmm. in perpetuity. That takes guts. It does. And and I mean, people say that I'm good on camera, but I've been I've been doing YouTube for two and a half years. You know, and you can bet the, that first six months of videos, I think all of them are trash. Yeah, uh, it, you you have to you have to practice like being on video is a skill. It's a craft like anything else. Uh, there's a reason that such a small percentage of people in news are on the anchor desk. Right. Because Everybody can't do it. Right. You know, everybody's not not built for that. They don't have the personality for it. They don't have the ability to to read that teleprompter and make it sound normal. They, you know, right. they don't they don't have the right demeanor, the bearing, the the personality that engenders the public trust or what have you. Like er- everybody ain't built for that. And so maybe video is not the or you on video is not the right vehicle for promoting your business. But one thing people don't realize is. Your face don't have to be on the video for you to make a video. Nope. Voiceovers are real. Voiceovers, Voiceovers have been used for ah, <laughs> as long as we've had broadcast media. Um, so, and sometimes you don't even need a voiceover. Stock imagery or custom imagery with captions and text is is a powerful medium. Uh, what what's what's that? Uh, I'm I'm having a brain fart, but there's tons of media outlets that use that as some of their most powerful, uh, forms of video. Um, well, there's, I mean, there's goal cast. I mean, they do that a lot where it's like motivational, you know, there's, there's, yeah, man, I, I totally feel yeah, them, the it, onion. Dude. Uh, yeah. what's, what's dude, I am having so many. I know what you're talking right about. Now. I know what you're talking about. Those, those little, uh, those like oddly satisfying ones. I, I I totally remember. You know that company. If we're talking about the same one, it actually got acquired. Um, and anyways, the name will come to us in, in a heartbeat. Um, here's here's kind of something that I always recommend to people is, you know, whatever's on your screen, you can share that. That's a story. You know. Yeah. Um, a w- recording a video from a web page is real and it is meaningful, you know, and it doesn't have to be your web page. It could be an article, it could be a blog post, it could be some sort of a PowerPoint presentation or a Google Oh, so Google let's Live. let's dive into that. Repurposing content and using content nice. that is, nice. is is not necessarily uh your own, but putting your own spin on it. So, like I had a I had a, a video a couple of weeks ago that did very well for me on LinkedIn that was about LinkedIn kind of a meta thing but 
the idea of the video I didn't come up with. It was because I had been listening to a podcast, the Think Marketing Podcast, by uh, Sean Cannell from Think Media. He's a big influencer on YouTube, uh, and now he's trying his hand at the LinkedIn space. But he had a uh, a podcast that he shot at Social Media Marketing World a few months ago where he had a LinkedIn trainer influencer as the guest and she was saying some really interesting things about the LinkedIn algorithm and how they've tweaked it to favor new content creators um, so that people who have been on the platform and producing content for a long time have big followings. Their content is now kind of getting push to the bottom um, because they're going to get the attention they need regardless. They've been there so long. They have so much influence. They're going to, they're, they're going to get the traffic they need, but now they're, they're trying to reward people who are adventuring into the platform, into content creation, whether it be video, photos, uh, text posts, and kind of boosting them in the algorithm so that they get more, they get more traction, um, you know, kind of get those those endorphins flowing and, and getting that sense of satisfaction from seeing your stuff uh, get some attention. And they call it the Robin Hood algorithm. So I made a video about his video and yeah, it did super right. well for me. Right. Um, uh, and so like really the content wasn't and then did, did, he share that? did he share it? Did he engage? What was the play on that? Uh, I don't think he, I don't think he engaged with it, but I, I made sure to tag him in the post. Right. And, and so the way the LinkedIn works, some people who follow him probably saw that and he has a lot of followers. Um, and, and I mean, the video did, did well. I think it got, I, I don't know if, I think it got like tw- I want to say like 2000 views, 2500 views. And for me on a LinkedIn video, that's amazing. So, and and so that's another thing that we got to go through when you're when you're uh starting to post and share content on social media is having realistic expectations. And and developing what those are only comes from experimenting and kind of putting out enough content where you're getting the feedback of data numbers so that you can accurately judge when something's being effective and when it's not being effective. Because a lot of times, unless you're putting money behind your content, um, the success of it is squarely dependent on how big an audience you actually have, you know, because we were talking about the algorithms and, and all that stuff. You're only your content's only going to get shown most of the time to people who are already following you. So if you yeah. haven't developed a large audience, you can't expect every clip to do gangbusters and go viral because most of the time it's only getting shown to a portion of the audience that you already have. So understanding the mechanics of these things is, is important to understanding when stuff is really working, when stuff is going viral for you uh, because if it's overperforming from what your content usually does, then that's something that you need to look at and say, okay, what worked about that? How can I replicate that and, and kind of break down why it did well for you? And then how would you say that we can use data? I mean, YouTube's got interesting data. You know, we can log into that. We can check out stuff. Oh, data that. is everything. What's that? Data is everything. Data the is numbers, everything. Let's, the, let's get into this. Talk to us about how we can be more data driven. Okay. So with all these platforms, um, there is some form of data that you can gather, whether that's just from the likes and the number of comments or with a platform like YouTube, they get pretty granular and you can see like retention time and all these different factors about how your video performs because their algorithm is using that stuff to, to calculate who they need to, to show your content to or recommend your content to. Um, and we can go deep on, on YouTube. I love YouTube. And, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that could be a whole nother show, but, yeah. uh, but like I'm saying, a lot of people start producing content, put out their first few posts, put out their first few videos. And because they're not getting a ton of traffic, they think it doesn't work. Social media doesn't work. I quit. Yeah. But the fact is most people are not producing enough content to start building up data that can give them relevant information. Um, I tell people that when you first start putting out content, especially on a platform like YouTube or uh, something like Instagram or or LinkedIn, you need to post as much as you can handle. Uh, right. Because until you give 
enough people, enough opportunity to interact with your content, you don't know what good content is. Uh, you hear people talk about high quality content all the time and that you need to produce high quality content. But the fact is most people don't know what high quality content is because they haven't produced enough of their content to figure out what of their content is high quality. Um, and, and data is what's going to tell you that. The feedback is what's going to tell you that. If you put out 100 videos, the majority of them get 50 views, but then you got 10 of them that got 100 views or 200 views, you need to go back and say, all right, these 10 videos, I need to do more stuff like that because right. that's what's working. But in these other 90 videos that I did, you know, they might have been okay but they're not getting the reaction that this stuff is. Why is this stuff getting the reaction? What was I talking about? How was I talking about it? Was I answering people's questions? Did I come up with these topics on my own? Like what, what's the story behind these videos? And, and, you know, when did I post them? How did I post them? Uh, what platforms were they on? Like, these are questions that the data is, you know, this is all data driven questions. Um, and, and, High quality isn't determined by, you know, what camera you shot it on and, and the bit rate and how you color graded it and how much you, how expensive the video was to produce. Quality is determined by the response of the market to the content. So if the market responded favorably to the content, even if it was shot on a cell phone from five years ago, then it was high quality content. If nobody watched it, then it wasn't. Then it wasn't. <laughs> You can spend a million dollars on very low quality content video. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or if like people, if the response to the content is we hate this, then it wasn't quality content. Right. Exactly. Uh, there's this. Uh, Unless you know, your goal is for them to hate it. Sometimes right. that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, there's this classic song, The Twist by uh, Chubby Checker. And, uh, he, you know, this is a great song, and my my two year old daughter has been has been listening to this song, and uh, you know, it's 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 a classic. I mean, we all have probably heard it at some point. But what's really interesting about this song is that, and really, what Chubby Checker did is that a year or two years later, this song came out in like this, like this, I think nineteen sixty or something, long time ago. Yeah, and two years later, one or actually one or two years later, what happened was. Either he made a choice or his producers or the record label or his agents, someone made a choice that he should actually go make another song about the twist called Twist Again. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking about that just the other day. I was like, you know, that's so interesting. He had a hit. It was, I don't know if it was number one, but it was a hit. And, you know, at some point he made a, a choice to, to repurpose, quote unquote, repurpose the content and then to come up with a new version of it. And that is exactly what people do on YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter and all of our content. We put something out there that sticks. And then we say, you know what? That That's an interesting topic. Let me explore that. And, and then do we do we do a remix on it. And we drop another single. And we keep delivering different versions of that content. And I think what's really good about that and really smart about that is that it's, it's, it is about repurposing content. And it is about having a theme, like a recurring theme that we continue to talk about and we, and it kind of sews, it's the fabric that sews all of our content together. You know, some people might say, well, your content's repetitive and I don't think any content should be repetitive, but there's a lot of different ways to say the same thing. And I think the final statement here that I'll say is that sometimes it's not what we say, it's how we say it. And it's the mm -hmm. entertainment factor of it. And it's the inspirational fact of, fact of it. You know, uh, what, what is your take on that, man? In terms of, you mentioned repurposing content, but could you give us some like like really intelligent ways to, to, to be smart about that. Okay. So for instance, with this right now, this podcast, if I, if, if I had the full recording and I was it going will. to repurpose it, what, what I do is I'm going to go through the podcast. Cause this is like, we're, we're on 40 minutes now. Um, and who knows how long we're going to go. Um, I'm up for a long conversation if you are, but, <laughs> but you probably got things to do, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrub through this content and this large piece of content, what some people would call a pillar piece of content, um, and I'm going to look for the best, probably, if I'm going to promote this over the course of like a week or two weeks, I'm going to look for like the four smartest things that I said in this conversation. And then I'm going to cut them out. And 
when I get that chunk, whether it's, you know, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, then I'm going to go through that chunk and I'm going to cut out all the stuff that doesn't matter and, and kind of condense it down to probably the best minute to two minutes, maybe two and a half minutes. And I'm going to put that out as a clip. Nice. And I'm going to sound like a genius because I cut out all the fluff <laughs> and, and people didn't have to listen for 40 plus minutes to get to the good stuff. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, it, it makes me sound really intelligent or you sound really intelligent if you're the one saying the smart thing. But but, it, you know, you figure out the best bits. Um, and over time, if you do that a lot, when you have these pillar pieces of content, these long form pieces of content, you can kind of tell once you review it, what are the things that your audience is going to respond to or what are the th- what are the insights that you gave that people in your area of expertise aren't giving? And you cut right. those out and you put those out. You put it out on LinkedIn. You put it out on Instagram. You put it out on Facebook or Twitter or wherever. And and um, you let those small pieces, those small moments of brilliance shine for you. And But then you can also, when you post that, you can put a link back to the big piece and say, hey, this was part of a larger conversation. There might be something else in there that you might find interesting. Go over here. Um, and a lot of people won't, but the few people that do are really the people that value your opinion and want to see what the other stuff was that they missed. Yeah. Um, Love that, man. We, we, we call it the waterfall method, you know? Um, I think you called it um, the pillar content. We call it anchor content. And, you know, long form, essentially, it can be video straight to a camera. It could be a podcast recording. So much you can do with, with this. I mean, this is a blog post. This is a, yep. you know, 10 really short social videos. I mean, we could even cut it could this be a bunch. It could be a week of tweets. It could be a week of tweets, you know. Um, you know, let's let's do this, man. Let's Let's get your best six-second drop that we can repurpose to a TikTok video. Ready, set, go. If you want to make content, you got to start because you're never going to know what works if you're not out there working. Boom. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Nice, man. Isn't the best content the stuff that we can communicate? It's really hard to say stuff in like a really short amount of time. You know, Mark Twain said it best. He's got a great quote. He said, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't have the time to write you something short. So instead, I wrote you mm-hmm. something long. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. You know, it takes a long time to, to get our content and our comments down to pithy, really punchy statements because we're thinking, you know, we're thinking as we go. And, and that's and I'm a chronic that. overthinker. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I have no shame admitting that. Like I, I sit on ideas. I go back and forth. I debate with myself. I procrastinate. Um, you, but, you, 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 you said you had a bait with yourself. Is that what you said? I debate with myself. You debate with yourself. Okay. Got yeah. it. And what uh, is that like? What? It, let's get into the, the mind of Alex Minor for a second. When you're debating with yourself, are you talking there. yourself? Are your lips moving? Do people around you say, are you talking to yourself? What's going on? What does that look like? Um, it's usually me staring out off into space with a whole bunch of worst case scenarios going around inside ah, my head. Okay. Uh, That's interesting. So you kind of you kind of adopt this thing of what could possibly go wrong, and then that objection handling. That's how you kind of deal with your solutions. That's what drives your creativity. Um, sometimes, most of the time, it's just starting. Like people don't realize how just starting is powerful. Yes. It's super duper powerful. Like most of the times when I sit and procrastinate and overthink the second that I actually start doing the thing, it's like, Oh wait, this isn't as bad as I thought it was. Right. Why did I wait so long? Right. Um, So I'm trying to get better and I have been getting better over time at just going ahead and jumping into the thing. Uh, and and that's with everything. That's with client projects. That's with my YouTube videos. That's with my LinkedIn content. Um, and, and somebody asked me about in another podcast, I think about, you know, my process with doing LinkedIn videos, whether I script them out or whatnot. Uh, sometimes I, I make like a couple of notes about things that I want to hit, like major points. But most of the time, I just got to turn on the camera and go. Um, one, because I don't really want to sound scripted. Most people suck with scripts. I'm okay with scripts. Um, but more so if I'm doing a voiceover than if I'm actually on camera. Uh, I've had a couple people call me out before that they could tell I could was reading a 
teleprompter. Oh, your eyes were moving. Eyes are like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, my studio is really small, so I can't do the you know long distance from the teleprompter. Um, so that helps. Uh, but I usually want things to sound genuine and organic, and the best way for that for me is just to talk. You know, I, I can't really do big scripts. Um, maybe I chunk it down where it's like if I make some notes on major points that I want to hit, I just handle one point at a time and then cut it together. Um, that works. Uh, but it's really about just getting off the starting line and, and starting to do the thing because, you know, ripping off the Band-Aid. Because the more that you sit and think about it, the less likely you are to do it. Right. I've been doing this thing lately where some problem will exist and I'll come up and I'll be talking to, you know, the wife or my kids or something and, and I'll be, and I'll just come up with something ridiculous, like some ridiculous solution. Like, you know, the other day we brought the baby into the house, she was on a nap and everyone was doing the shh thing. And I was, you know, I was like, all right, there's gotta be a better solution than to have a sleeping baby in a room over there where no one can talk out loud. You can't be on the phone. You can't talk. You just have to be in you know, like quiet mode. And then I was like, and I was talking to my six-year-old kid. I was like, you know what, Donnie, we have to build a soundproof cocoon with video, multiple video cameras inside of it so we can place the child inside with like HVAC, you know, temperature control, like just like basically a space shuttle that we can put the baby inside where we're not affected by that. And it was this whole joke that I was going on and it's like this, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, dealing with issues, you know, this like, you know, humorous way to kind of solve it. Um, and and then I was like, and the, the joke was done and no one laughed, of course. And uh, and then my kid was looking at me and he and he was like, that's it. I got it. So then he's like, come with me. And I was like, OK, I don't know what's happening because that was just a joke. <laughs> so so we, we follow you. You know, I follow him into this studio right here. And he goes to these leftover little sound, uh, those little sound tiles that I have. And he's like, let's do this. Let's actually build this. We'll build a little sound booth for the baby to sleep. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, we're sitting in it right now. I'm like, when the baby's on a nap, you know, we should just bring her in here. We've got a camera. We've got AC. And it was like this ridiculous idea. <laughs> of getting a sound That's booth. awesome. And I was like, we have it right here. So now... You know, now the baby, when the baby's on a nap, the baby sleeps in here. And then I just, I just, you know, go inside because this has, we've got, we've got tons, tons of soundproofing here, you know, right? we got all, everything we need to, to be soundproof and like temperature controlled. So it's kind of a funny thing. And I just started to realize, I've been thinking about this where, you know, the mind is a muscle and like the way that we think creatively, you know, that just takes exercise and, you know, society and teachers from, you know, our younger days and so many people have been telling us not to think creatively not to think outside the box and that you know everything has to just be like colored inside the lines but in fact that's that's not the case at all and i think now more than ever you know we're we're constantly looking for innovations and solutions and creativity to solve yeah. problems you know and, and i think part of that also is that people need to let go of perfectionism it's it's a terrible it's a terrible thing that we try to impress into people at all stages of life, that things need to be just right, that they need to be perfect, that you have to get the right answer um, all the time. And, and like you're saying, that starts from, that starts from grade school. And, and it, it's, it's really paralyzing for a lot of people, myself included, which is why I'm trying to get better at just starting things and throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, because, like you were saying, creativity is a muscle and you need to exercise it, but that exercise can be messy and sloppy. And, and it means that you're going to get it wrong. A lot of the times it's, it's really more akin to the scientific method which some people might say, Oh, well, science, that's all about processes and, and getting the right answer and stuff. But scientists create hypotheses that are wrong all the time. And, and that's part of their job is to get it wrong so that they can eventually get it right. Because if they got it right every single time out the gate, then they're probably not innovating. They're mm. probably not, you know, going any further down the road of scientific exploration. And the same thing applies in business. The same thing applies in creative creative pursuits. Because um, because I'll tell you, I used to do music. And one of my problems with music was that I thought 
um, that the first time I went and recorded a song was that that was it. That could only be it. I could never mm -hmm. re-record it. It mm -hmm. like I had like the best take or the best version of the song would always be the first one that I did. But then a few years ago when I started getting back into music and I started watching all these podcasts and shows about, you know, professional music producers and how, and songwriters and their process, I found out that the pros do all these versions and all these iterations. And, and sometimes they're, switching out songwriters and they're switching out vocalists if if it's a producer driven project or if it's a vocal if it's driven by the recording artist they're switching out the producers and the tracks and they're trying all these different versions or the engineers might try um you know 10 different sets of drums to try to fit, to get the ones that sound right and it blew my mind and I'm like yeah. like and so I started um, with my songs, I started going in and doing a rough cut or doing a demo version, but then I would take that and listen to it and figure out what I had done wrong. And then I'd come back and re-record it. And almost every single time the re-recording, because I'd kind of studied the original, like a playbook was better. Um, right. and, and that was, that completely shifted my viewpoint on creating music. Um, so like even when I was working with other people, if I had a producer send me tracks, I there were times where I would, you know, once I had the song done, I would say, you know what? These drums just ain't hitting like I like my drums to hit. And I'd spend a day or half a, or a few hours going through drum sounds and replacing drum sounds, you know, keep the same patterns or whatever. But but replacing drum sounds until I got the sound that I liked or the one that I thought was great. Um, just things that I had never done before replacing instruments uh, or adding on to things and just, you know, experimenting, you yeah. know, taking a chance with the sound, not saying that, Oh, the way that it came to me is the only way that it can be. No, there's always room to expand and innovate and, and to do new things. And, and that was a great lesson for me. Awesome. I can totally relate as a musician, you know, having produced music and gone through that process. And one of the things that I realized is that, you know, there's there's the essence and then there's the the filigree, you know, of, of what we cr create as, as like creators, you know, and we can change a lot of the filigree. And that's that, that's infinite. That's perpetual. That, that can just never stop. You can all you can keep changing instruments and and drum beats and sounds and stuff like that. But it's the essence that I think that really makes something pop, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and and finding the and and changing the filigree sometimes is what drives us to find the essence of it, you know. And I think that moment where you find the essence of it, um, that's pretty magical, you know. And I've been there, and I I try to get there, you know. It's, it's there's this uh, Chinese term for that where everything is in alignment, you know, Wu Wei they call it, and I, I think it's so I think it's so powerful to go that journey, but. You just mentioned, you know, sometimes it would take a half a day or a day just working on beats, you know, just working on the drums. And that is exactly what we have to do, um, you know, for everything that we create. We have to put in the time. You know, I mean, the title of this is why our marketing videos don't don't work unless we do. And part of the working is that experimentation and like finding the right beat. Yeah. And just being willing to, to take time to get good with the video and, and that doesn't necessarily mean to get good with lighting or to get good with shooting technique or to get good at writing scripts it just means doing more of it because as you go along uh you know there's always a lot of debate um and no matter what kind of art form that it is or or endeavor that it is business or otherwise about quality versus quantity and the thing that i found out with you know like with that musical process we were just talking about or whether it's creating video is that quality will lead to quantity eventually the or quantity will lead to quality eventually because <laughs> here it comes <laughs> hello oh, we got a new what happened we got a new guest on the podcast who is this who is oh this? this is my son jet <laughs> i got Hi. Yes, you doing? got a sword, so go off and defeat some evildoers, okay? Nice. No, I don't have evil things to do yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, go off and do some superhero things, all right? I'll be out in a little bit. Oh, that's adorable, man. We are. Oh, we got another guest. Hi. Yes, that's my daughter, Elle. Hi, Elle. How you doing? She, she just yeah. finished first grade. Oh, <laughs> like, like today, like in the last couple of minutes? Yeah, yeah <laughs> first grade is officially over today. Right. 
it's it's funny with homeschooling they can do an entire grade in like a week if they wanted to <laughs> i know she wants to do second and third grade and fourth grade stuff she's like she's she's much more ambitious than i was when it came to the learning hi al how you doing yeah what was that yeah. She says she has a first grade to third grade Spanish book. Oh, okay. Bueno. All, right, all right, guys. All right, guys. I need you to leave. Bueno. Adios. Wait, especially you, little one. Come on. Come on. All right. Out. Close the door. Let daddy finish the podcast. Out. Podcast out. bombing. It is a it is a real thing, you know. Yes. Out. Go. Oh, no. <laughs> oh man. There was a, there was you're a, fine. You're, I will be out. A, you're right, right. Man, you're good. Okay, huh. There was a there was a clip where I was yeah. okay. Uh, I was I was on. I was doing a podcast, and my kid. This was actually the time where my kid broke my door handle, which is what I was telling you before. And he came in during the video. It was actually not a podcast. It was actually a tutorial video on Dub. You know, and I was. Like, <laughs> Someone how to use dub and it was basically a, it was a it was a live sales pitch right? nice and and he comes in and then i didn't realize that I, I thought i had ended it i was like hey thanks a lot see you later i gotta run and go back to homeschooling so i thought i hit the end broadcast button but i didn't and i was sitting there with my kid and it was all being recorded live broadcast nice basically telling him how how he shouldn't come in and, and basically destroy people's stuff and I was like, oh crap, what if I was like mean or what if I was upset or angry? You know, sometimes we get upset with our kids and I go back and I was like, you know, I don't really get like that. I'm, I'm usually cool about it. And I, I love it when I, he actually, you know, deconstructs stuff because it's like his engineering mind. So that I went back in the video and I watched it and I went and I fast forwarded to the part where I was basically, it was like an unadulterated, you know, father giving discipline to his, his son for, for basically destroying something. And I went back and I watched it and I was, I was really happy about myself, man. I was like, you know what? I handled that exactly how I wanted to handle it. And I didn't know I was live. I didn't know I was being recorded. And I was like, you know what? I was, I was mindful. I was calm. Like I really appreciated like the why behind what he was doing. And I put myself in his perspective. You know, he, he wants to be with me. He wants attention. Yep. You know, he doesn't want a barrier to, to come in between us. And I was like, I embrace that, you know, and then now I there's no lock on the door and I do what you do, Alex, you know, I let him in and, and it was, a, and it was an important moment for me to kind of realize that. Um, and I, and I left it in the video. I did, it was, you know, it was on YouTube. I could have trimmed it out cause you know, you can trim on, on okay. YouTube. But I, I think I things it. like that are, you know, what, what we're talking about, about video being a way for people to really get to know like who you really are. Right. You know, that's, that's a great moment. That's like you, you couldn't have planned that. Right. You know, but the camera caught it and it was a great genuine moment. And now the people who have seen that have a much, much better idea of what kind of person you are in your real life. And, you know, to take that clip and to use that as a post on LinkedIn or maybe not YouTube, but maybe LinkedIn or Twitter or something. I do that. You know, it's a story. It's a story. People mm -hmm. need empathy right now. The stuff that people are going through right now with, you know, our calls being disrupted and, and to, to actually see a real life situation to get, you know, Zoom bombed or whatever you want to call it, you know, video bombed, live video bombed by your kid, you know, um, there needs side note, there needs to be like some better, better way to like a, like a memeified way to describe that. Like, <laughs> Zoom, Zoom bombing is, is not enough, but, but, uh, you know, that, that, that alone is, a, is an interesting piece of, of content, you know? Yeah, it's it's like I said, people just want to know who they're dealing with these days. Right. They want to know that you're a human being. They want to know that you that you can feel the type of emotions that they feel, that you can understand their situation, you know, that that you're a family man, that you're that you have values and, and that you that you treat your kids okay. Right. You know? like, exactly. <laughs> can you imagine if that video was like me just like unleashed? Like if you had torn into him, you would have lost so many customers that day. <laughs> Oh man, that's a trip. Well, well, listen, Alex, um, this was a great combo, man. Where where can people find you on YouTube? Um, just search for Alex Miner. I'm the okay. first one that comes up. Um, I'm not sure if there are any other Alex Miners on YouTube. Are okay, there? got there it. Probably is, but I'm the first one that comes up. Um, I've got an okay channel. I got about 2,600, 2,700 subscribers. Uh, we're growing slowly because I don't have as much time to put into it as I would like, but hopefully that will change this year. Nice, man. And then, you know, people can find you on LinkedIn, Alex Miner. And then what was your website again? Uh, 
I am media E Y E A M M E D I A. Nice, man. There's some plugs, Alex. We appreciate you, man. You know, you are, uh, you got a dub account, man. I'd love to get some feedback on our, on our new tech, you know, our integration with YouTube, you know, we yeah, got to dive back in and see what kind of goodies you've cooked up. Nice, man. We, we've been working hard, man. And we've actually really embraced the YouTube ecosystem. So one of the problems that we're trying to solve is that when you send someone to a YouTube link as for, as a, as a customer, like as a prospect, you kind of are losing them to the, to the YouTube ecosystem, which is amazing. Like I, I love YouTube. I'm a YouTuber. Dub app has a whole show on YouTube called the daily dub, but you know, specifically for business, it's sort of like a hole in the boat because once you've sent them to that link, then mm -hmm. Now it's YouTube at doing its work to get them to watch more recommended videos and to drive more advertising revenue. And it's sort of a loss for us. So one of the things that we uh, innovated on is this idea, this idea to in, uh, import a video from YouTube onto your dub account. Mm. And the reason why that's valuable is because you can put a YouTube video on a completely controlled, you know, landing page with calls to action, a calendar integration, you know, real time chat. And, and that way you get the best of both worlds. You get the engagement on YouTube, but then you can also present a path, you know, a conversion funnel, a path so that people can book a time or click on a link or do something to like make the whole effort kind of worth its while. So, you know, definitely take a look at that and uh, uh, take a look at the mobile app, man. Real time editing. You know, this is people struggle with editing like crazy. You know, um, once you take a video and have to get it to an editor, it could take weeks and it could cost a lot of money. So. We sort of built out our mobile app to allow for real-time editing, you know, record a clip, record another clip, add some text, add some music, you know, yeah. very inspired by Instagram stories, Snapchat, TikTok, um, but it's all for business, obviously. So I'd love to get your feedback on that and really appreciate the time, bro. Hey, thank you. I love having a good conversation and this was a great one. Nice, man. Be well, my friend. You too. Take care. Yes, sir.